It's time for another solo war game campaign, but in our last campaign between the Bromans and the Orcs of the Great Latora Khan, we learned a valuable lesson. It's a lot more fun when you've got a lot more people. In fact, our solo campaign turned into a group campaign as a number of people jumped in and said, hey, that battle looks interesting. I'm going to run that battle too. And of course, here at the House of Wargaming, our response is, bro, that's awesome. You run it. That's canon. We're going to fold that into the campaign. Now, we did run one little brief kind of sideline scenario. It was a rescue operation, and we had multiple guys. I think we had eight guys run that same scenario, and then we rolled a D8 to figure out whose version would be canon. It was an interesting little exercise, but we want to expand that for this next campaign. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a campaign similar to the way we've done the last few, and then... I'm not going to run any of the battles. You are. Now, now, when I say you are, I mean you guys are. We'll have to figure out. I'm not sure about all of the logistics so far. For today, all we're going to talk about is what the general plan is. And basically, it's to be to provide you with as few limitations and as much freedom of movement as possible. We'll, we'll put together a, a campaign. And I'm going to be the basically the GM for this kind of odd group exercise. And... Um, there's not going to be a particular genre. I, I'm, I'm going to use, and just as with this book here, it's largely written for the black powder era. I am going to be tracking horse, foot, and guns. We're going to do a limited kind of a light supply issue. Got to make sure your supply lines are intact, but that we will have a way to provide for some ability to, to use a strategy of cutting off an army from its supplies to force them to retreat or to respond. A little bit of that, but that said, uh, you know, if I hand out an assignment, hey, you want to run this battle here, here's your horse, foot, and guns, I'm not going to tell you what that horse, foot, and guns mean. It could be late medieval, where we're talking about those big 50-ton cannons that were an absolute bear, and they fired once every five minutes. It could be even something up through, say, World War II, where I say, oh, I've got so many cavalry guys. Okay, great. They're going to be armored cavalry. Oh, that's possible, but, you know, I, I don't know how that works out. I'm not a World War II gamer. Not interested in that era at all. Uh, primarily, you know, once you get up into the, the black powder, that's where my interest starts to wane. So we're going to do, like I said, kind of a black powder, but, you know, it's up to you guys. It, it, what if we have no cannons at all? And I say, look, here's infantry, here's cavalry. And you say, great, I'm just going to do like a Dark Ages. Well, all right, it is what it is. You know, if, if you want to do that, you do that, and you report back to me. Here's who won, here's who, you know, here's how many casualties both sides suffered, here's the aftermath, and we'll kind of make a few rulings just so that we can all stay on the same page. So with all that out of the way, let's take a look at the campaign that we generated. And I want, I'm a big fan of using random generators. So what I did is I rolled a d50. I mean, I went online and I generated a random number between 1 and 50, and the number that came up was 40, I want to say 42. And I just now realized that the answer being 42 is awesome. That's Tennessee. I said, okay, great. How many counties are in Tennessee? There are 93. I generated a random number. I think it came up 86. Hey, great. Count down 86 counties. That's actually 90, you know, count up from 93 because it's easier. Union County. I said, okay, when well, Union County, now that's what we're looking at here. And I looked at Union County and I said, wow, this is, this is kind of an interesting little map. Now, Union County itself is very small. It's only like this big, maybe eight miles across. Now, eight miles is not nearly big enough to run a war game campaign. Maybe a skirmish campaign. I wanted to do something a little bit bigger. You know, we like having multiple armies stomping all around. So I said, well, let me let me jump on USGS.gov, that's the U.S. Geological Survey, and they have a host of topo maps available for free. You can just download them, and that's what we're looking at here. This is actually a 1975 map of the vicinity, and I, I chose this particular scale. This is 1 to 100,000. Because at one, oh, I'm sorry, this is 1 to 250. The scale I chose is 1 to 100,000. I downloaded the 1 to 100,000 map, and um, we, we can go look at that right now. Well, actually, before we do, let's look at this. So this is a little bit big. The 1 to 100,000 map is actually something like about yay big. I took a look at that map, and I said, well, this is good. I've got Knoxville, Tennessee down here. I've got Johnson City. Well, actually, this is Johnson City. And this is Kings, what is it called? Kings Kingsport. Kingsport, it's a landlocked state. It's got a port. Pretty awesome. Where do you go, Tennessee? Hey, well, wait a minute. Kingsport, is that in Tennessee? 
Yeah, it is. For those of you that are familiar with the geography of this area, this is Kentucky over here. This is Virginia. Or is it West Virginia? No, that's, that's Virginia. And then way right down here, you even have a little bit of North Carolina. So it's kind of that quad state area. Anyway, the point is, I took a look at the map and I said, yeah, about that size is good. One to 100,000. So this is going to be our general outline. And we'll look at that. But the other thing, now, as a war gamer, you should be looking at this and going, hey, we've got some big lakes, right? We've got a road network. What are these little snaky looking things? Well, this is Clinch Mountain. This is um, Cumberland Mountain. Uh, what, so, the oh, Powell Mountain, uh, Copper Ridge, and that's what we're looking at here. We are looking at a series of kind of basin and range, ridge and valley, that kind of directs the general flow of things from Knoxville to Kingsport. So this is going to be our capital. This is going to be our other capital. And then I started looking around for something right in the middle that would be worthwhile, would be worth fighting over. And this pink star is going to be it. This is the goal of the campaign. This is a little town called Sneedville. And whoever controls Sneedville, it's about the halfway point, whoever controls Sneedville at the end of the campaign will win. Now, you can score a minor victory by... Um, not controlling this and maybe stomping all the armies flat. Maybe if you invest your enemy's capital. It's kind of embarrassing when your capital gets burned. Take it from an American. You Brits know what I'm talking about. We're going to turn the page, though. So that's kind of the general flow that we're looking at. We're going to have an, an east and a west country. And the, um, well, well, we'll get to that. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So that's the goal of the campaign. Let's go ahead and make the victory conditions really easy, simple to define. We're going to run this campaign for up to 90 days. At the end of 90 days, whoever was the last to march an army through Sneedville wins the campaign. In a little bit, we're going to roll for the starting date. And uh, we'll also declare that in order to capture Sneedville, you have to spend a full day, you call it pacifying the locals, Taking the government back over, it may change hands several times, but you need to have an army in Sneedville for a full day. Here is a satellite map that shows the area of the campaign. And if you look down here, for those of you that understand, this is kind of the outskirts and, and edge of Knoxville is down here. And then you've got all of these wonderful little pale green farmland, grasslands, pasture land. And here you can see really well, this dark line is a nice fat ridge. One of the beauties, here's Sneedville, you can see the little roads coming through, and then up here is Kingsport and Johnson City. A lovely part of the country, I've never been there, I feel bad for stomping armies around and burning some of these villages to the ground. But the point is, you know, this is going to provide us with a lot of really interesting tactical and strategic challenges. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the next step. So here is our 100, 1 to 100,000 map that shows the lay of the land. And we're using this as I pulled this off of Google Maps. So what we have here, the yellow is our road network, right? Sneedville, Knoxville, Kingsport, just to get yourself oriented. And in keeping with the Solo Wargaming Guide, the Solo Wargaming Guide wants you to uh, nominate classes for each of your cities. The largest city will be A. Big cities that are not capitals will be B. And then C cities. And this tells you how many troops will be generated. Two to five regiments, one to five. With this, we're just going to use just the general. A regular company consists of 150 men. A regiment is five regiments, excuse me, five companies to the regiment. So 750 guys per regiment. We want to have as even a fight as possible. Well, it turns out by dropping our border in the red, it works out great because we have on the side of the nation of Knoxville, obviously Knoxville is our capital. Morristown up here by Cherokee Lake will be our second biggest city. We've got two C-class cities up here in the northwest, Tazewell and Middleborough. The rest are a mix of D and E class cities. And then over here on the Kingsport side, we've got Kingsport as the capital, Johnson City as our big city, and then we've got a couple of C class cities. Where are they? Uh, big Stone Gap is a C class city, and I, I nominated them at random. I said, okay, aside from A and B, which two will be our C class? It turns out it's a Big Stone Gap, and where's the other one? Uh, Greenville down here is our other. C-class city. So these are our foundries. These are where the cannons come from. And that's going to make a difference for our general mobilization. We'll get to that in a second, right? The point is, 
we've got one A class, one B class, two C, four D class cities, and seven E class cities. I, I had to kind of redo and that. So that's 15 towns per side. And if we just kind of look at this, right, we're going to have some bridges are going to be an issue. And the beauty of this campaign is that you're going to be able to jump on Google Maps. We have two armies meeting down here at Cherokee Lake. You're going to be able to zoom way in and, you know, you can see the resolution here isn't so hot. But you can jump on Google Maps and you can take a look at exactly what that battlefield looks like. You can look a little bit wider and say, okay, well, if I'm this general, I'm going to try to meet here. This is a better defensive position, right? There's an instance where I was poking around on the Street View map. And like this, you see this bridge right here that connects Mor Morristown to Bean Station? This is a couple of causeways, but over here at the second one, there's like a little campground here. And in addition to the major bridge, there's kind of a ford. There's a beach that connects these, a little narrow spit of land. So if you fought a battle here between Beanstown and Bean Station and Morristown, there's a lot of interesting things that can happen. Uh, as tactically and strategically on the tabletop. Now, I will point out what we're going to do is movement rates for our armies per the solo wargaming guide are based on the notion of bad roads and good roads. Okay, and by the way, one hex is five miles. So we're going to be able to look at the actual distance. You can ask for directions. Hey, Google, how far is it from Knoxville to Kingsport? It's 100 miles. And I did that on purpose. Bear in mind, this is about 100 miles across and about 100 miles tall. We've got 10,000 square miles of battles to go. If you just want to look at this terrain map, this will provide some guidance as well. The light green areas are open country. The darker green areas are uncrossable ridges. These kind of middle ground green are forests. Now, as far as the roads are concerned, the interstate system here, I-40, I-81, I think there's I-26 comes down here. These are the only good roads you've got. All of these state highways, that's what the little shield here is, these are poor, I'm sorry, these are, yeah, these are poor roads, but they are roads that you can traverse. The white lines are the same as these yellow lines. They are also poor roads. However, the big difference here is that in some areas, remember we talked about the ridges, and these ridges are... They're, they're not huge. They don't completely block movement. But they're, I don't know, you know, maybe a mile, two miles across and maybe three, four hundred feet high. Trying to get cannons and wagons and horses over these things, they're generally forested. Not going to be easy. Going to be a lot easier to go around for the most part. So what we're going to say is that if you want to move th over those ridges, you can go across at the white lines. The white lines... Oh... I got it. The white lines are considered cross country, but you can move across them regardless of the terrain. They still only count as open country. So where you've got thick woods, like up in here, it gets really thick. The woods do. So if you're moving in this area up here and you can kind of see how heavily forested it is, as long as you're moving via the road network, you can ignore that. And likewise, when we look down here at Cherokee Lake, you're moving cross country. It's going to be a lot slower to go along the north coast, but there is a bridge here. So you may want to send an army along there. Moving across that bridge counts as open country. In a lot of cases, you know, obviously you could go north up here to I-81 from Greenville. It's probably going to be smarter to go this along I-70 and then take I-80. And, you know, in a lot of these cases, why would I even care about roads? I can move across open country. That's a fair point. But again, up here where you're into the ridges... Up here, there will be areas where, and you can kind of see, there's a road. That's a nice little pass. Uh, and you can kind of see the, the light the light green through here. And particularly once you get way up into here, there are some areas. For example, right here, if you want to march an army from Everts to Big Stone Gap, and I, you see I drew a little, yeah, this is allowed. You can kind of cross the border and leave the, the campaign area. This is the only way to go. That white line, you're marching across country, but it's really tall mountains and getting over here to Big Stone Gap ain't going to be easy. You're going to have to go this way. And let's take a look. Now, moving on, 
The next thing I did is I said, well, let me go ahead and just kind of get a better idea for what my road network looks like. And so that's what these green lines are here. And because our armies are marching along roads, we're not going to measure as the crow flies. In previous iterations of this campaign, we would break out the ruler and we would say, now it turns out uh, one inch is equal to, I want to say about 15 miles on this scale of a map. But I don't have to worry about measuring like this, again, from Beanstown to Mor Bean Station to Morristown is about 15 miles. But I said, hey, well, let's take a look from, from the center of Morristown to Bean Station. If you ask for directions, Google will tell you that's 10 miles. To get from Corrington to Bean Station, that's 36 miles. And remember, as you're marching along these roads, these poor roads, the yellow are poor roads. So if we have infantry, which you're probably gonna, that infantry is only going to be able to move 10 miles per day. Okay, and again, remember, this is um, black powder era. You're talking about not just the infantry, but their supply wagons, right? So poor roads, this little jaunt from Corrington to Bean Station is going to take three and a half days. Likewise, I was showing you up here where the only way between Everts and Big Stone Gap this is 36 miles. It's only, if we measure it, it, it's only about 20 miles as the crow flies. But you got to march around mountains and come down through here. You're marching cross country in addition. So that's where weather really starts to play, have an effect as well. If you're marching across country, off-road, infantry, oh, it's only two. What does that affect? It's the off-road off is the same as poor road, huh? Oh, I think it's if there's weather effects. I think if you're in the country when it starts raining, you're in big trouble. Anyway, that's what we're looking at. So that's our general road network. You can use any road. You can march cross country. You can cut up this way if you want. Like I said, you can cut across the all of the white roads count as moving cross country. But I really like this road network because all points can converge on Sneedville. Whoever controls Sneedville controls the world. It's a very important crossroad. Now, if you look at this on a map, I don't think Sneedville is very big. I think it's a few thousand people at most. Pretty little town. I highly encourage you to take a look at that. Um, how how accurately you depict Sneedville on your map or wh whatever, if you have a battle for Tazewell, how accurately you do that. Maybe, like I do to my two millimeter, I may just plonk down. Yep, that's Tazewell now. It's up to you guys. And then down here, like uh, Seaverville, that's off limits. Down here, we can just kind of hug the way. And then back again over here, too. You can go from Irwin to Johnson City by just cutting across. Uh, this is kind of an arbitrary line that I put just to make sure that I had an even number. Like if I had brought this red line down into Seaverville, then there would have been one extra city here. It worked out really well. In fact, you know, sometimes the fates just all line up. I can't tell you how pleased I am that my random county gave me, like I said, Union County is right here, but it gave me such an interesting map with a lot of movement between cities. Now let's talk about supply, right? We got the same situation where if you can cut somebody off so they cannot draw a, a an unbroken line to Kingsport to their to their capital city, uh, well, I mean, that's going to be really hard to do, right? Particularly Knoxville here because there's just one, two, three, four, five, six. There's like eight different ways you can, you can draw lines along the yellow. It's got to be roads not the white. But if by some chance the Knoxvillians should cut off an army over here by taking what Duffield and they got an army in Sergoinville and there's some you know they've cut off an army of the king's portions in Jonesville, it could be an effect, right? And we'll go to the rules here. It's like 10% loss per day per the drought of supply, but for now we need to look at the distribution of forces. Going back to our town sizes, here they are. And I said, all right, how are we going to do this? We are going to give, I don't, where's my notes? Well, here I just wrote down who's where, okay? Barberville is a D-class city. Oh, I, I should also point out, so I used this, I used this to start with for infantry. This, this, we already looked at this, right? Force allowances. That's just infantry. Okay, by the time you're done distributing all of the infantry, what you will find is that each of these two countries... Now, oh, by the way, I put an arbitrary boundary between the two. Again, right, just to make sure that we had the same number of communities on either side. 
So Sneedville, at the start of the campaign, is controlled by Knoxville. And the king's portions are going to be the attackers trying to take Sneedville. They want to push this boundary out a ways. Okay? In addition to the infantry. So that gives us a total of seven regiments of infantry. Uh, four, four. And I just, rather than roll dice, I want to keep it as even as possible. I want you guys to have a, a balanced encounter here. Knoxville gives you four regiments. Jefferson City gives you, not Jefferson City, Morristown gives you three. So that's seven regiments right out of the gate. And then there are a total of 35 additional companies, which gives us another 35 divided by seven is five. So we've got a total of 12 regiments of infantry altogether. Some of those regiments are going to take some time. We're going to have to figure out how to combine, for example, up here, if we have three, three, uh, and four, what we may do is combine all ten of those. We'll, we'll muster them at Pineville, and you've got two regiments of infantry. Now, I also gave everybody the same number of supporting troops. And uh, what is it going to be? Um, I don't have my notes. But basically, I gave them all a couple of light horse. I gave them two batteries of cannons per C-class city. So they've got four of those all together. And then I also sprinkled in some heavy horse. I put one heavy horse in each of the major cities. And then I also have a couple of lancers here. A couple of lancers. I think it's four altogether per side. So I will tally up and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what that force allocation. Oh, no, I've got it right here. Look at that. I already did it. I'm, I'm so smart. Like I said, seven regular regiments of infantry. They're going to call up another 35 companies. They will combine as best they can into an additional Seven regiments, so 14 regiments all together. They've got four batteries of artillery, two heavy horse, four lancers, and four light horse. Each of these guys, you know, batteries, I, I think we're going to call it like 10 cannons per. And then uh, for the horses, it's going to be 150. Each of these units will be 150 per squadron. I think that's how you do it. So one, one call it regiment of heavy horse, we'll have 150 heavy horse. We will allow... Forces to fight until they will be effective until they receive 50% casualties. So our regiments have 750 men. When they fall down to 374 effectives, they will be disbanded. That regiment is out of the campaign. So if we take a look at this, you know, just kind of generally speaking, we need to figure out what the mobilization is, and that'll be the next part of this video. But if we just kind of look at this, you just kind of, you know, if you're in charge... As a general, and I'm going to combine these into three, generally into three armies, like we always do. And once we've completed our mobilization and everybody has rallied to a town that makes sense for each of the armies, that's where I'm going to step back and say, okay, how is Kingsport going to attack Sneedville? Once we know how quickly the Knoxvillians can respond to the threat, we'll take a look and decide how you guys will either do a poll, watch this space, or uh, maybe we'll throw one up on Twitter. I don't know. Well, maybe on the blog over at johnmollison.com. We'll figure that out. Uh, but first, and it's going to depend on how quickly the Knoxvillians respond to the threat. But for now, what we can kind of look at is say, you know, if the goal is to take Sneedville, it's going to be defended by two companies of infantry. Rogersville and Jonesville are the nearest if they can, we may be able to send these five companies of infantry, one light horse, and two lancers up to take Sneedville right off the bat. That may be... We, we may decide, oh, you know what, though, but we're afraid of these guys all rallying up here at Harlan and marching down through Pennington Gap. Maybe what we need to do is combine all five of these. What do we got? Two, four, six, nine, thirteen companies of infantry... We've got two batteries, we've got four lancers, and a light horse. Maybe we combine all of these guys at Jonesville. Maybe we bring these guys all together at Rogersville, and maybe everybody here down south, we're going to combine at Newport, so we've got kind of a, a north, south, and center. I'm not sure yet. Before we get to that, we need to see, like I said, we need to see a uh, couple of things. Oh, there's a couple of other things we need to, to determine for these forces. And that is troop quality. We need to figure out where our light infantry come from, where our heavy infantry come from. And I think what we'll do is assign 
two light. And so we've got we've got these regiments. I think we want to have two light and two heavy infantry. And I don't know where those guys are going to come from just yet. I, I, I suspect that maybe what we'll do, just to keep it simple, let's go ahead and have our two light infantry come from the B-class town and the two heavy infantry come from our capital. Does that make sense? Most populous. And, th and then that way we start out the campaign. Now, we're only going to start out with two regular line infantry. And then all of these kind of guys out here in the podunks, they're going to combine to form regular infantry as well. Light infantry, heavy infantry, specialized forces, they're going to be more of the professionals. So there you go. We are going to wind up with a total of two heavy foot, two light foot, and you know where those are going to come from. All right. Now, with that said, we need to worry about troop quality. And I want to have... Two veteran units for each of these nations, and I want to have three green units for each of these nations. And to randomly determine, and this is where they're going to start to take on a little bit more personality. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll a d5 twice for the veterans for each side, okay? And on a 1, it'll be light infantry. 2, 3, 4, I want it to be more likely that those line infantry are green or veteran. And then as you can see... Uh, you know, as, as we show here. So if we do the Knox Villains first and we roll for our veterans, we get a two and we get a five. And so we're going to have a veteran line infantry and a veteran heavy infantry. And I'm just going to put a little K next to that. So there's our two Ks. And then I'm going to put a K for Kingsport. Wait, Knoxville and Kingport will start with a K. Okay, well, I'm going to put a KN for Knoxville. Rolling with the punches, guys. And now for the veterans for the Kingsport, we get a 7 and an 8. So Kingsport has veteran lancers and a light horse. Oh, that's interesting. Or dragoons. So the King's portions have veteran horse. See how we're already developing a little bit of personality? Knoxville is is better at infantry. Now we have to figure out the green unit. So I'm going to roll three times for the green units for the Knoxvillians. One, so eight, two, and a five. So they are going to have um, a line infantry, that other heavy infantry, and what was the one? Eight is going to be the light horse. Then I got to roll three times for these guys. Two, six, and eight. So that other light horse for the king's portions, the heavy horse will be green. And then they're also going to have a green line infantry. So looking at King's Port, we've got uh, two heavy horse. One is veteran, one is green. On a one through four, the veteran horse comes from King's Port. So this is our veteran heavy horse. That makes this our green heavy horse. Well, that was easy. Let's hope they're all that easy, huh? Making a note here. We got our veteran and our green. Now we've got two light horse, but we've got light horse. We've got uh, one here, 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 and here. So we're going to roll first for our, what is it? Uh, light horse for our veteran. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two. So this is our veteran light horse up here in Pennington Gap. Then we have, that is our light horse, we have a green line infantry and a veteran light. Oh, I forgot the veteran light horse. So I got to roll a d6 to figure out, no, no, I got to roll a d6 to figure out which is the green light horse. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this new port, this is our green light horse down here. And then we have a green light infantry, oh, a line infantry for Kingsport. And as I said, our light... Light infantry is coming from the C-class, so that's going to be of this regular infantry here. It's going to be two regular, and of them, one is going to be green. And then that's it for the Kingsport. Now, looking, I think, I think things are a little more complicated down here in Knoxville. We have um, a heavy infantry. Now, one of these heavy infantry, they're here and here. One through four, our veteran is in Knoxville. Yep. So our veteran heavy infantry, heavy foot is veteran, and our, oh, no, it doesn't matter, because we've got one heavy foot that's veteran and one heavy that's green. So green heavy foot. Okay. 
Let me, let me redo that. It's going to be a green heavy foot and a veteran heavy foot. All right. Now we got some character going on here. Heavy infantry and uh, heavy infantry. Then we've got a green light horse. Where's our light horse? One, two. In Barberville. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Five, six. So our green light horse is down here in Coryton. And then we've got two line infantry that we need to establish. And we've only got two fully, uh, well, wait a minute. We've got, well, let's see, this is our, what did I say? Two of these are heavy. Two of these are light. So I've got one, two, three. So it's one, two, four, three, four, five, six to find out where they start. And with a five, it's going to be a green infantry in Morristown. There you go. So now we've got a little bit more character. Our line infantry, we've got a green line infantry here. And then oh, we have one veteran line infantry as well. Uh, so these guys are, we, we've only got one more. No, we've got two here. So one of these infantry is going to be uh, green and one is going to be regular by light, line or medium infantry. There you go. So I'm going to go through and I'll, I'll have to tally up all of these units. But there's something we need to do first. We need to do some mobilization. And here you go. This We're going to roll a D6 to figure out what happens. These guys, we also need to figure out the date. Let's do that first. That's fun. I got a D12. Let's find out what month they decide to mobilize. Nine is September. What day in September will they mobilize? I've got a D30. They've decided to start mobilizing on September 15th. 9.15 is day one, and then we roll a D6 compared to this chart to find out when the defender begins to mobilize. And on a four, defender begins to mobilize the same day the attacker crosses the border. All right, that means these guys are caught completely with their pants down, and we need to figure out what our mobilization is gonna look like for these guys, and then you all need to tell me what their attack plans are. Once they cross the border, that's when these guys will start to bring their troops to bear. So I think it's a pretty good bet since we're only, you know, a couple of miles from the border. Sneedville going down to bring overwhelming force. That's all I know. After noodling through the best way to combine all of the Kingsport armies in a way that makes sense, what I hit on was putting... Basically, all of these guys are going to mobilize up here at Jonesville. And the furthest guys out are the Gate City companies. They are going to march through here, Duffield and all that. Basically, all of these guys are going to combine here at Jonesville. Everybody here in the center of the map is going to combine down here at Rogersville. And then all of these little southern guys are going to wind up combining. And they're going to march up to Greenville to serve as kind of a mobile reserve or a southern flank. So the boys down here in Newport, they're going to go up to Greenville. And then they may be marching right back down home again. What that looks like when you tally up all the numbers is a little something like this. Our guys in the north, Jonesville, you've got three regular line infantry, two batteries of guns, two lancers. Oh, you know what? I said the, the Lancers move a little bit quicker. You're going to have two Lancers down here in Rogersville as well. I broke those up a little bit. We've got two units of Lancers and one veteran light horse. That's here in Jonesville. And again, Jonesville is right up here on the border. Rogersville, you're going to have a combination, and this is the heavy punchers here. Three regular line infantry, two regular heavy foot. You've got one veteran heavy horse, two batteries of guns, one light horse, and two units of Lancers. A lot of flexibility there. And then down here in Greenville, all these guys down here, Irwin, they take a while. They got to go up through Johnson City, cruise on back down. So they are going to be the last to arrive. And that's what this date is here. It's going to be five days to get ready. Remember, we started on the 15th. Five days to get ready. A day to kind of, two days to kind of rest, figure out, get command structures. Everybody meets each other. Maybe a day of drill. So after the 21st, the Jonesville Army can march out on the 22nd. The Rogersville Army gets their act together a little bit quicker. They can march out on the 21st. I checked weather. Clear skies, at least through the 22nd. 
And then the Greenville guys, they take a little bit longer. Like I said, these guys down here in Irwin, they got a long way to go to reach Greenville. And you're going to be dealing with two regular line infantry, one green line infantry. You've got a green heavy horse, a green light horse, and then a unit of regular light horse. So all together, you've got three units of cavalry, two of which are green. You've got three regiments of line, one of which is green. And that is where your armies are. Greenville, Rogersville, and Jonesville. Now, if we take a look at the marching times, what you will find is that the army in Jonesville is only 20 miles from Sneedville. The army in Rogersville is 28. So it's going to take them three days. And remember, they're ready a day earlier. So if we, and here's the question for you guys, what are we going to do with these three armies? Rogersville attacks Sneedville. What do you do with these guys up here in Jonesville? Do you pull back to Pennington Gap? As a reserve, because you don't know what's going to happen to all these forces up here. You've got a lot of guys. You've got a total of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fourteen. You could probably bring one up from Tazewell as well. You're going to have three regiments of infantry plus your miscellaneous. You've got a couple of batteries. You've got two lancers, one light horse. They're going to be itching to get over here and kind of start putting pressure on the north, I would imagine. Right? The boys down here in Knoxville, they're going to race straight up the gap. Uh, we don't know exactly know what they're going to do. It's going to take them some time. I'm envisioning that these guys will pull back. Now, the other question is going to be, so here's the two questions we have. Does the companies of infantry in Sneedville stick around? They are going to get hammered by one of two forces. They are either going to get hit by three regiments of line, two batteries, two lancers, one veteran light horse. Now, normally I would do a... Siege, but this will be the first battle of the fight. 300 line infantry in Sneedville defending the town from all these, from this big army marching up. Now, there may be, and I don't know, you guys take a look, there may be a pass here that's very easy to defend. If, well, but again, their first indication, they're only going to have a day to prepare. The, they are right on the border. So, you know, really, they're going to muster and have to, you know, call, basically calling out the militia, right? So the bit, first question is, do we attack with Jonesville or Rogersville? That's the first question. Do we hit them both at the same time? Do we take Sneedville? Do we just bring them in one after the other? In fact, like I said, it's a three-day march and a two-day march. These guys have a one-day head start. So they can all arrive. Both of these armies can arrive in Sneedville at the same time. So that's really, I guess, the three choices. Um, do we send Jonesville directly in uh, to put pressure on the north? Either to Harlan or Middlesboro. So we can say, Jonesville head north? Or does Jonesville attack Sneedville? Does Rogersville attack Sneedville? Maybe we send Rogersville into Bean Station to try to take this crossroad. What do we do with these guys? There's our three questions. Um, in light of how complex this first issue is, why don't you guys go ahead and hash it out down in the comments section? Tell me what you think the three armies, Greenville, Rogersville, and Jonesville, should do. If you have thoughts on what the defenders of Sneedville should do, should they just retreat to Tazewell to try to link up with these guys? Let me know. When we know what's going to happen, I'll be able to put together uh, a battle plan for the Knoxvillians. We'll figure out who's mobilizing, where they're going to meet, what the threat is. You know, does Greenville just stop? Do they just wait to see whether they head north? Do they see if there's a threat to Newport? Do they march to Newport? That's the other thing we got to figure out. Maybe these guys march to Newport knowing that they can either put pressure on Knoxville or ride up due north. These guys really have a much, much easier go of things than I had expected. The fact that, that Knoxville is getting caught up with uh, unexpected invasion is really going to hurt them in the long run. I think you have enough information to speak intelligently. Hash it out in the comments section. As I said, as the GM, I'll come to a final decision as to what their plan is, and we'll come back with a new video to discuss what those early moves are and how Knoxville, and I, I think you guys can see where these units are. If you have any ideas on where Knoxville should accumulate their forces, throw a link down in the section. We're just going to talk about it, figure it out, and then we'll put together some battles in the next video. 
and you guys can either take those battles or volunteer, or we'll, we'll kind of figure it out as we go. One thing I know for sure, I don't think I'm going to be fighting any of these battles. Unless this whole 40-minute video is for nothing because nobody's interested in playing, in which case, I'll do it. I'm always up for a war game, and I think you are too. So I look forward to seeing what you guys think is the smart play here for the King's Portions. Next video, we'll figure out the smart play for the Noxvillians. Till then, I'm praying for you.